Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good afternoon to you all. I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to address the audience on this key topic in this crucial moment. The European Parliament elections are quickly approaching and I believe that these elections may prove to be the most important European Parliament elections since Hungary joined the European Union 20 years ago. I myself spent 16 years in Brussels, mostly in the European Parliament, and I also stand now as a candidate for member for the European Parliament. I think that we are living in a historic times with existential concerns on Europe's doorstep. Peace or war? The stakes are high. I believe that we are not only deciding in the next five years, but we are also deciding on the future of the European continent. In this spirit, let us recall what Roger Scruton famously said, good things are easily destroyed, but not easily created. One thing is for certain, the outcome of these elections will be absolutely vital in defining the destiny of the European Union. I still remember the time I moved to work in Brussels in 2003 before our accession. I personally experienced this period as a moment of justice in history because it's clear that we Hungarians have always belonged in Europe. Hungary's EU accession was also a key step towards our continent reunification. At that time, we decided to partake in an integration process based on strong Europe of strong nations, and we have not given up this ambition, and we have not given up our vision ever since. On the other hand, we have all seen, especially in recent years, that the EU failed to provide adequate and competent answer to the many key issues and challenges facing our community. Today it looks like Europe is losing the battle against history. European citizens are becoming victims of this incompetence again and again. Illegal migration, terrorism, war, energy crisis and inflation are putting immense pressure on us and on our continent. In the wake of this crisis, the fundamental question persists. What form should the future of Europe take? On one hand, we hear voices trying to convince us that we should move towards building a United States of Europe. On the other, Hungary in the past 14 years has taken on a leading role in working to build a Europe of nation states, forming coalitions, gaining more and more allies, and receiving increasing attention from the international community who is growing more and more interested to understand the Hungarian way of thinking and the secret of the Hungarian winning formula. To evaluate this debate and shed light on Hungary's perspective, I will reflect on some key mementos and patterns from the past two decades. I am convinced that instead of relying on abstract ideologies to form a rational verdict, we should draw conclusions from lessons of past crises because this will be the only way for Europe to get back on its feet stronger and ready to face the next challenge. First, let us revisit the original objective of the European Union, which had two key dimensions, key dimensions, peace and prosperity. Political thinkers often frame global politics as cycles of integration and fragmentation. Post-World War II Europe, fragmented and war-torn, naturally moved towards integration. The EU emerged as a visionary endeavor to recognize the shared economic interest of sovereign European nations, fostering economic recovery and resilience through a common market. This integration also provided the framework for enduring peace through institutionalized diplomatic collaboration, as Robert Schuman noted. European cooperation does not diminish or absorb the nation, but confers on it a broader and higher field of action. This was the spirit of the EU's founding fathers, who respected the unique nature of diverse nations, acknowledged our Judeo-Christian roots, and understood that peace is fragile. After 1989, when the fall of communism brought Hungary winds of hope, a nation for long oppressed by foreign regimes was finally on the road to revival. Joining the European Union was widely seen by citizens as an opportunity to empower this process further by using the instrument of institutionalized cooperation. A mutual ambition arose, Europe empowering member states, 
member states empowering Europe. Unity in diversity was perceived as a motto that celebrated the richness of the European character and respected member states' national and intellectual sovereignty. In light of this, Hungarian people were generally optimistic about joining the EU. I still remember the day when the results of the referendum regarding our EU membership were announced. Along with new member states, the European Commission hailed the decision, and I quote, saying, marking the end of Hungary's separation from the European family of democratic nations to preserve peace and prosperity and to show our oneness with the rest of Europe while safeguarding our own identity. Everything was given for Hungary's accession to be the next big step towards Europe's reunification, manifesting in a strong Europe of strong nations. However, times of adversity reveal true character, not just of individuals, but also of corporations and institutions. Hungarian citizens expected stability, safety, and prosperity after joining the EU. We knew challenges would arise, but no one anticipated the magnitude of the crisis we faced in the past 15 years. Instead of evaluating this crisis individually, I will highlight a faulty pattern that has led to increasing division as the promise of the EU seems even more distant from its original ideas and the notion of stronger together. I would like to invite you to a thought experiment. We are approaching the summer holidays, so let's say that all of us in the room will go to an exciting weekend trip together. We have two options. Option one, we go to Lake Balaton for sailing. Option two, we go to Salika Valley for horse riding. Who votes for option one? Who votes for option two? Okay, so we will go sailing. The only issue is why should we all go on this trip all together? Democracy involves decisions based on majority consensus, unanimous consensus on matters where no external influence should dictate our fate. When it came to the migration crisis, for instance, this was exactly the case. Why should someone in other member states, let alone a European institution, decide on who Hungarians should live together with? As a result of our history, Hungarians have developed a keen sense of threats when it comes to threats to our national sovereignty. And Hungary was not alone in noticing this issue. The top-down handling of the migration crisis already started to cause notable resistance from member states. More and more began to see signs that this is not what they signed up for and began to question the status quo and the democratic legitimacy of certain European institutions of their decisions. Following the migration crisis and Brexit, with a growing sense of disillusionment, European leaders saw that new steps needed to be taken to ensure that democracy remains an integral part of the European Union identity. Launched in May 2021, the Conference on the Future of Europe, for which I was responsible in the government, was a unique, unprecedented scale initiative launched by the European Commission to bring together citizens, civil society, and political leaders from across the EU to discuss and shape the future of Europe's continent. With the use of a digital platform, it promised to give European citizens an opportunity to express their views on a variety of topics, starting a seemingly inclusive international dialogue about some of the most future-defining topics of the 21st century. Hungary was one of the most active participants in this conference on the future of Europe. While Hungary's Prime Minister was the first to share his views on the future of Europe, published in the form of seven points, <coughs> Hungarians organized hundreds, actually it was more than 800, local conferences and expressed their views on the platform, quickly putting the country on the map of the most engaged member state in this pan-European dialogue. Citizens truly believe that with their active participation and commitment, they would be able to tip the scale towards the European Union favoring voluntary cooperation between sovereign nations as opposed to supreme federal European empire seeking to impose top-down measures. While Hungarian citizens, including myself at the beginning, believed in the opportunity of a sincere dialogue, our hopes quickly faded. At the end of the day, it was revealed that the Spanish European consultation was merely a tool to legitimize a pre-written script of the federalist elite and that the initiative was not in fact aimed at gaining true insight into citizens' opinion, 
but instead an instrument seeking to reinforce the EU's mainstream leaders' own ideology, which placed a federal euro at its core. Unfortunately, Hungarian citizens' views failed to make it to the final conclusion of the conference, despite their, our, unprecedented collective efforts to make their voice heard. Instead of the principle of democracy, top-down federalist agendas and double standards prevailed. The next crisis already arrived, actually before, and also during the conference on the future of Europe, we had to face the COVID pandemic. Member states leaders were trying everything they could to protect their citizens, and they did so under immense time pressure. During this time, Hungary was heavily criticized for seeking unique ways to obtain life-saving vaccines, thinking outside the box of the European institutions and making better deals. But at the end of the day, what business is it of European institutions how the lives of its citizens are saved? And now, most recently, when it came to the war in Ukraine, Hungary was and is still heavily criticized for making every effort to stay out of the conflict and not intervene. But what business is of anyone else if Hungary decides to stay out of the war? The European Union by now seems to have completely abandoned its two fundamental objectives set out when it was founded to guarantee peace and prosperity. In fact, the Brussels bureaucracy <coughs> is now pushing for escalation of the war rather than laying down the groundwork for peace. It is not an overstatement to say that Brussels is playing with fire. First, they wanted to tell us who to live with from the top down. Then they disregarded millions of citizens' opinion about the future of Europe from the top down. Then they wanted to tell us how to survive the pandemic from the top down. Now they want to tell us how to handle a war on our doorstep from the top down. And only a few weeks ago, they shut down a conservative international conference attended by prime ministers and members of the European Parliament using police force. What is next? Today, Brussels is balancing on a thin edge between war and peace and between oppression and freedom. This is dangerous and the upcoming election might just be our last elemental chance to tip the scale in the right direction and save Europe. Contrary to the original authentic promise of the European Union, a bottom-up consensus-based project which allowed for cooperation of member states in fields where there was a mutual interest, we are clearly saying that European institutions began to behave as an independent supreme superstate, an empire trying to exert top-down influence, and in fact they would go as far as to try to punish member states who question the status quo and seek to continue to exert their national sovereignty in matters which do not require unified answers. Is it a mere coincidence that double standards against Hungary and these so-called rule of law concerns seem to appear in parallel with the fact that Hungary's attitude towards the European Union never changed along the way? We never subscribed to the ideology of the United States of Europe, but we continuously stood up for the will of the Hungarian people, and we continuously asked their opinion on crucial matters that define their lives. Did the original objectives of the European Union get lost along the way? It seems to me that Brussels has sacrificed democracy for hypocrisy, weaponized the rule of law, abandoned constructive dialogue for open threats, introduced political pressure through financial blackmail, and ideological witch hunt. In the meantime, the EU's competitiveness is declining, an economic crisis looms due to the gravely misguided sanctions policy. Meanwhile, not long ago, the Spinelli Group, along with the Union of European Federalists, the Young European Federalists and the Jean Monnet Association, published the European Election Manifesto for the United States of Europe, calling on to the reconstituted EP groups after the European elections to condition the election of the President of the Commission and his or her colleagues to the support to launch a convention for the federal reform the treaties, which actually resulted for from the Conference on the Future of Europe. This was their original idea, and they managed to get it through in the European Parliament. But this is not what member states signed up for. 
and Federalists are not even trying to hide their agenda anymore. So I ask you the question, migration, pandemic, war, gender, are these the kinds of matters we want someone else to decide on or have we fought enough for our national sovereignty through history to be handled as adults on the international stage? Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the real stake of the European elections on the 9th of June and I encourage all to vote and have their say. Then shortly after the elections, the Hungarian presidency is finally approaching. We remain ready to contribute to the success of Europe in tackling current and upcoming challenges. Not because it is easy, but because it's hard. Not because we can carry on as usual, but because we need change. Not because there is already a consensus on how to proceed, but because we are yet to find it. We will always strive for a peaceful and prosperous Europe, committed to its member states and Judeo-Christian heritage, which we can proudly pass on to our children and the upcoming generations. We will always envision a Europe strengthened by robust nations, where member states respect one another and work together effectively for peace and prosperity. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a fruitful discussion about this absolutely crucial matter tonight. Thank you.